start? I'm not sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Francis, and I am a practicing astrologer, intuitive, and author of the Llewellyn 2019 and 2020 Sun Sign books. And I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is retrograde planets and how to reclaim them. So I'm uh, just going to start with a couple of key points. Uh, my approach to astrology is best described as purpose centered. So I, I really resist the notion to sort of make everything in astrology one dimensional and look deeper into, yes, you have this, but what's its purpose and, and not just how it functions, but what is its purpose? Uh, you are not your chart and your chart is not you. It enlightens you and you enliven it. So there is a relationship between you and the energy that you were born with, which is represented by your birth chart. Everything in life cannot and is not always forward movement. I just want to let that sink in for a second, which really forms the basis of how I look at retrograde planets. When talking about retrogrades today, we're just going to be talking about the birth chart. We're not going to be talking about transits or progressions. And before we proceed any further, I wanted to just thank Linda so much for inviting me to do this because it really gave me an opportunity to uh, reconnect to the parts of EA astrology that have always been meaningful to me. Um, I have a first edition, first printing of, of Jeffrey's uh, astrology. Uh, Pluto book one, and I wish I could say it was in pristine condition, but it's not. Uh, I wanna say how much that book changed my life. And so I've had, although I, I'm not an EA astrologer, I really do deeply respect what EA astrology does. So basic info, info. Always like to just start with a foundation so we know where we're going. There's at least one planet in retrograde motion 80% of the time. And sometimes, you know, in, because astrology is such a complex language, we sometimes forget these basic things. When a retrograde planet, when a planet is retrograde, it is at its apogee, which means it's closest to Earth. The average person has two to three planets retrograde. And obviously, neither the sun nor the moon can ever be retrograde. Okay. So in doing this talk, I mean, this talk comes really from my own personal experience. I have six, six retrograde planets in my chart. And of course, you can understand as I began to study basic astrology, it, it was a little bit disturbing and discouraging when you looked at how Western, the Western astrological tradition views retrogrades. And here's just a few quotes to sort of get us in the space. Uh, Ibn Ezra says, if the planet is about to reverse its motion, it forecasts unsuccessful consultation, difficulty, and destruction. And according to William Lilly, retrograde planets will be riotous and vulgar. I think that's really funny, when not, not well posited. Other words he uses includes delays, recurrences, returns to previous conditions, reversal of events. Hellenistic astrology. Now, this information comes from Chris Brennan's book on Hellenistic astrology. Paulus calls them impotent, ineffectual, and insignificant. Valens commented on retrogrades when talking about annual perfections, a, a timing technique from, uh, from Hellenistic astrology, calling them weakened, restrained, hindered, and giving only appearances and hopes. Other references describe delays in manifestation. So if you're looking at the Western tradition as such, it, it doesn't leave you with a lot of positive feelings at all. Okay. So again, where does this leave us? Uh, the notion that retrogrades come with inherent blocks and obstacles. It, that the only good movement is forward active and assertive movement and retrogrades then become a millstone, an albatross and a major impediment. Hence, retrogrades are weak. This, to me, is a rather one-dimensional approach and leads to all kinds of uh, decisions, 
reflections, insights that, that leave a person, you know, if you were me, leave you feeling like, well, okay, so what am I supposed to do with all this? Instead of looking at it, asking what would be the purpose of having those positions. So in my mind, we've often defined retrogrades by what we perceive they are not rather than what they are. So, okay. Um, I need to move this down to the bottom. Okay. So, you know, I looked at other traditions, including AA, which we'll get to in a second. So, Vedic astrology sees retrogradation as a form of dignity. And, and because planets retrograde are as close to Earth as they can be, they are brighter and more visible. Thus, they loom larger and have a stronger presence. Therefore, their effect is greater. I'm quoting Alan Anand, who is a Canadian Vedic astrologer. Now, of course, we realize that Vedic astrology only works with the seven classical planets. However, uh, the, you know, the, the business of them being closest to the planet Earth still remains true. And of course, as we now are beginning to realize or it, it become more obvious to us, is that Uranus actually is visible in the night sky. Now I have to say that, I have to apologize that, well, I want to apologize because this slide doesn't look like the rest of them. I added this today because I thought that I wanted to revisit what EA astrology feels or uses as its guidelines about retrogrades. And so of course I turned to Jeff's book or Jeffrey, I'm sorry, I still think of him as Jeff. Uh, so in his book on page 30, any planetary function behavior that is retrograde must be given individual definition. And when I read that, it really resonated for me because it's really what I'm going to be talking about as we move on. It creates a reactive retreat from the status quo. And of course, in our world, the status quo has a lot to do with what's going on outside us, not very much about what's going on inside us and what and how what goes on inside us fuels us going forward and how we live our lives. And I really love this, this the, the last part of that quote creates a reactive retreat, uh, oh gee, I've read that before, from societal and collective definitions, expectations and pressures to respond to life in conforming ways. So this is my view of how retrograde planets function. Retrograde planets are a call to go inward, to develop a strong inner life. For the person with retrograde plants or whatever retrograde plants there are, and we'll talk about how each one functions momentarily, there is that need to be aware on an inner level that you really cannot uh, move forward without understanding that inner response. So retrograde energy for me is as strong and powerful as direct. It's just that its purpose is different. Retrograde energy must process before it acts. It doesn't mean there will never be any action. It just means you gotta go in before you can go out. Retrograde energy does not change the symbolism of the planet in question. So we're not changing definitions or behavior patterns or any of the things that we normally associate with the planets. Retrograde asks for a different expression of that energy. Its purpose is to connect to an inner reality before moving out into the external world. So sometimes I can feel like, you know, you just can't get it going. And we'll talk about that, but it has more to do with understanding what your particular process in life looks like when it comes to that, whatever retrograde planet you have. It's reflective and receptive. It, Retrograde energy gives us an opportunity to observe how we use the energy of that planet. So let's talk a little bit about people with retrograde planets. 
they have a drive to integrate their internal experience with their external reality. So in other words, they're more often likely to see the inconsistency between internal and external. I'm sure we all know people who seem to say one thing and do another and don't seem or, or and just don't seem to see that there's any kind of incongruity at all. And yet, if you have a retrograde planet, you're more likely to see the inconsistencies and try to reach some form of um, not just consistency, but, you know, it's kind of like not only talk the talk, but walk the talk. For the person with retrogrades, this is a necessity. For someone without retrogrades, it's a choice. So I don't mean that people who don't have retrograde plants or you don't have a particular plant retrograde doesn't mean that you will never take the time to uh, observe those things. It's more a case of you, it's a choice rather than a necessity. Work on an inner level comes first. So the person with retrograde planets, say you have Mars retrograde. Well, you're not gonna be able to take action until you really understand what that means to you inwardly. How does that energy work for you? There is a natural tendency to go inward. A capacity for introspection and the development of an inner awareness as a compass for living life. And again, this is a necessity for those with retrograde planets. This is coupled with a, a, a strong push to reframe and recalibrate how you use the particular energy of any planet that's retrograde based on your life experience. So I feel that people with retrograde planets will, you know, will look to see why something, why something is happening. What is the purpose of what's going on in my life? Okay, personal and social planets retrograde. There's a feeling of being out of sync that pushes you inward. Hesitation and uncertainty, at least that's what it feels like until you start to realize that this is more about needing to gather more from the inside before you move forward. Everyone else seems to be moving forward while you're still in the starter block. How can you tell I have more as a retrograde? Anyway, uh, so again, it's that feeling out of sync. You know, and, and Jeff really Jeffrey really alluded to that and encapsulated it rather well. It can create a resistance to anything imposed from outside the self. So there's that, that resistance, that need to have indivi an individual approach and, and need to honor oneself and it, it's not so much about rejecting everything that's outside you it's more a case of choosing to act from what's inside you as opposed to always just reacting and thinking that life happens from the outside in the purpose for you to carve a life's path by de developing from within so there, there can be a challenge if you feel that externally you're not living or being what you are internally. And sometimes that's a challenge, especially if you, if you really are uh, a rebel at heart. Okay, we're going to talk about Mercury, Venus, and Mars and what the qualities or what the purpose is of having Mercury retrograde. I mean, I think we know what the qualities are, but what's the purpose of it? And how is it, how is, what do you need to do in order to use that energy uh, in a way that is productive uh, and positive? So you need to develop your own voice. You need to trust your perceptions and to continually revisit what you think and why. Now, sometimes that can lead to analysis paralysis, but you know, there's always, 
you know, there are always challenges in using any planetary energy, whether it's direct or it's retrograde. Venus retrograde, to develop a set of values that reflect your own experience of the world, not anybody else's, but your own, to strengthen your connection to yourself and to define relationships in ways that move outside the me versus them dynamic. So this is someone who's going to spend a lot of time Again, sometimes not feeling really connected. And yet, of course, Venus is about connection. So when you go inward and you develop a connection with yourself, it's much easier than to develop healthy uh, connections with others. And you get outside of the me versus them dynamic. Mars retrograde, to pursue what you desire, typo, there uh, with courage, strength, and consideration based on an understanding of yourself and consequences. And it's interesting, of course, right now we're living in a Mars retrograde period and Mars is retrograde in the Aries. And so, of course, this is not necessarily the, the uh, intent of Aries, which is to take time to consider consequences. However, as it's retrograde, we now have an opportunity wherever Mars ret retrograde, and I know I said I was gonna about talk about transits, so my apologies, we'll move on. Uh, I have lots of observations about that Mars retrograde, but I'm not gonna share them right now. Cause I might run out of time. Anyway, so, and here we are, Jupiter and Saturn, the social planets. Jupiter retrograde to explore ethics, values, and beliefs in order to define a personal spiritual path to find deeper meaning in life based on your own experiences. Again, it's, it's so much of retrograde energy is about your own experience. And, and rather than trying to fit your experience into ex, ex, the external aspects of life, what goes on outside you, it becomes a case of, of trying to bridge the two and bring them together in a way that, that is healthy. I keep on saying the word healthy because I do think that, that retrograde energy allows us a, a, a tremendous opportunity for self-reflection and self-reflection can lead to all kinds of healing and awareness and insight. And the other thing about Jupiter retrograde is if you're working with it and you have come to an understanding of, of the previous two parts of this, your ethics, your values, your beliefs, your personal, spiritual, the deeper meaning, then you're in a space and a place where you can transform it into uh, all into a wisdom that can be shared with others. Because after all, Jupiter is a social planet. It is about connecting and to others being part of your community and your world. Saturn retrograde. Now, of course, we know that Saturn retrograde often gets a really bad <laughs> reputation, you know, absent father, difficulty in moving forward and create, you know, in achieving goals. Uh, here's my take on Saturn retrograde. To create your own definition of what you wish to accomplish, in other words, what is success to you, and to build structures in your life that reflect who you are, not where you came from or what you've done. Because of course, Saturn is as much about tradition in its own way as the moon. And it's always about what you've done, what you've created. So outer planets retrograde. Outer planets, now you'll notice I did not separate them out. Uh, simply because I think that they are already about shifting consciousness. They're already about going inward and being aware of shifts and changes within and being able to move those outwardly. So when they're retrograde, that intensifies the demand for self-reflection and awareness and deepens the experience 
in other, and really it, to me, it becomes an itch that must be scratched. And of course, you know, when Jeff talks, Jeffrey talks about Pluto retrograde, that, that really is an obvious thing that, that, you know, you're pushed inward to, to find your own path in life to, to evolve in a way that is reflective of your own process, not uh, reflective of conforming to an outer set of guidelines. So the purpose of Outer Planets Retrograde, to amplify the push to get outside your conscious mind and your physical world, to see the big picture, to fully immerse yourself in the process of healing, Chiron, clearing out deadwood, Uranus, dissolving the toxic, Neptune, and transforming the self, Pluto. All of these are forms of rebirth. Okay, pit, so of course we have to talk about potential pitfalls of retrogrades because uh, we live in a world of duality and whenever we engage with an energy, we are engaging with all sides of it, not, not just the side that appeals to us. It reminds me of when I first started studying astrology and, and Chris McRae was my teacher and one of the first things she cautioned us was that when you start studying astrology, the first thing you're gonna do is focus on all the negatives. And you might forget about the positive things that you see in your chart. In this, in this case, I'm kind of doing the ver reverse. I want people to see what the positives are of retrogrades and how they can be used uh, to, make, to live your life more effectively. So, potential pitfalls. The challenge with energy turned inward is that the process can get hijacked and everything remains internalized, which can lead to going in circles, circles and more circles. No action is taken either internally or externally. Now this can be a big challenge because part of the process or the, the experience of having retrograde planets is feeling out of sync and not being sure always exactly how to express that energy in an authentic way. So sometimes it can seem safer depending on what's happening externally. It can seem safer to hold all that in. And because you can't necessarily take action, at least not external action, it can seem difficult to find any action to take. Because quite frankly, we don't always think about anything that we do on an internal level as taking action. We tend to define action as mostly an external thing. And often when you're working with retrograde plants, you may not even notice that a change has taken place until you find yourself in a familiar situation and your response is different. So if the, and if the retrograde plant makes no aspects, Again, one of two things can happen. Again, the energy remains within, or if it is externalized, it can act out like a two-year-old. So, you know, it, it, because the energy is not communicating, the planet isn't communicating with any of the other um, members of the committee, as I like to say, then, then when it comes out, it doesn't have any reference points. So it can act out in ways that seem slightly immature. And the truth is all of these things may happen and then you may find your way out. I'm not trying to say it's either or, I'm just indicating uh, what the potential pitfalls are so that you understand uh, what, when you are in, the, in a space of reacting or acting in, in a way that doesn't, um, isn't useful to you. Okay, so how do we use retrograde planets in delineation? Uh, well, first of all, remember, don't isolate it as a single factor that, and, and we do have a tendency to do that, especially when we're just learning about something, we can focus all our attention on it, get very laser focused on it, and, 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 and you need to initially in order to 
like for instance today when after this lecture is over this webinar is over and you want to sit and work with your birth chart you know you know you part of what's going to happen because it is a retro you're going to be internalizing stuff and it may not seem obvious to you immediately how to connect it to everything else however we need to remember that no one factor in a birth chart can tell the whole story uh, so retrograde planets cannot supersede other factors they add a dimension of understanding of the person's development outlook and way of being it's like adding more color and more and, and, and a depth of understanding and awareness question is the retrograde planet angular or succeeding or cadent you need to look at house position is it conjunct an angle because of course if it's conjunct an angle it you know it, it what it's asking when it's conjunct an angle is for the person or persons wh whoever's looking at your anyways i okay my my mercury Uranus Quincunx is doing a number on me right now. Uh, so what it's asking you is to really make the deeper awareness that comes from the retrograde function a part of your everyday life because when it's conjunct an angle, it's connected to the cross of matter. And the cross of matter defines how it is you are on the planet. Okay, what aspects does the retrograde planet make? So how many other members of, uh, of your committee are, are, is it talking to? And you know, here uh, it's important to also recognize that the more, uh, if for instance, say the outer planets aspect, the, the inner planets, the less those planets are, those retrograde outer planets are gonna feel generational to you they're going to feel very very personal so that's another thing to take into consideration when you're looking at the interplay between the retrograde planets and the rest of the chart so if you have um, outer planets just aspecting outer planets and none of them um, connect to your inner planets that makes a huge difference in how you experience that energy and how you work with it it may seem that the energy of the outer planets is, is again, something uh, outside yourself because it's outside your human self. It may not be uh, outside your, your total being, but it can be outside your human self. Do, do the aspects that you see amplify or inhibit the planet's purpose? And that's an important question to ask yourself because uh, it can indicate challenges in, in it doesn't mean you can't, uh, like for instance, if you have Saturn opposed Pluto, uh, that is gonna be a huge challenge in trying to transform your reality because Saturn will often ask, well, we worked so hard, we built this, what's wrong with this? Why does it need to be remade? Okay, does the retrograde planet provide a balance or counterpoint to other factors in the chart? Okay, so say, for example, you have a, a really, um, say you've got Mars in Aries and it's angular. And so it, it, it's often, depending on weather aspects, I'm, I'm just singling things out, my apologies, but in talking about this it's necessary to simplify it a bit say you it so you have more of this uh and it's direct it's in aries it's angular and so that person has a tendency to act before they think so a retrograde mercury would be a bonus in that space and place depending on the aspects and that sort of thing but it would it, it's kind of like a bit of a, 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 a take a deep breath before you jump off the cliff without a parachute okay so i just wanted to uh, share some charts and uh 
I have to tell you that sometimes life really is magical because I didn't really have any particular famous people's charts in mind. Uh, I, I thought, well, let's try an athlete and let's try Michael Jordan. And of course, much to my uh, surprise, well, not surprise, it, it turned out to be it turned out to be a great example because of course he's considered to be, in case anyone doesn't know who he is, the, the greatest of all time NBA basketball player. And look at that, he has Mars retrograde. And this isn't something that you'd expect to see in the chart of an athlete, not one of, 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 of the kind of scale and ability that he had. So you can see when we look at this that it immediately uh, shows you that some of the Western interpretations of retrograde planets really just don't apply. And of course he has, uh, you know, we're not going to go into a, a, a deep analysis of his chart, I just was looking for examples that allowed us to understand that that a very limited definition of retrogrades, which has often existed in in Western astrology, including Western modern astrology, that it really can do a disservice. And especially if you happen, I mean, you can be doing a disservice to yourself. And if you're seeing clients, you can be doing a disservice to them by making an assumption about how that functions and it, it's even opposed Saturn. So you see that this is one of those times and places where you realize this is someone who understood what to do with his energy and used it in a way that brought him great success and a great sense of accomplishment, which is that Mars Saturn opposition. Now he does have Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto all retrograde. And um, he's got a Pluto retrograde quincunx at Saturn. So you can see by looking at this that, you know, as much as we look at what he's accomplished, you know, there are challenges in his chart in terms of coming to a deeper self-awareness. Margaret Atwood. Okay. And, and I just, picked her because uh, I'm Canadian and she's Canadian and uh, but I picked her intuitively again I didn't really have hadn't really ever looked at her chart before um, and when you look at Mercury retrograde she's a writer Jupiter Saturn retrograde a lot of the material that she's written over the course of her uh, lengthy career uh, has been about ideas outside the box. Uh, Handmaid's Tale comes to mind. A lot of it dystopian. Uh, and so she's really gone her own way, which is what you'd expect looking at this particular array of retrograde planets because she has uh, six. And again, here we see that this is not at all inhibited her uh, in terms of, of accomplishing the goals that she set for herself and for her and for her receiving, you know, worldwide recognition for her writing. Oprah Winfrey. And again, I just picked her just picked her uh, intuitively. And the thing that I found fascinating about her is that she's got Jupiter retrograde at the mid heaven. And what did her job become? Her job came, became to, to introduce people to new ways of look, inspiring people, looking to a new spiritual path, to seeking wisdom, and all in a way that had never been done before. Now, I mean, of course, the fact that she's in Aquarius amplifies that. It's just, I found it fascinating that it sits right up there, very close to her midheaven. 
And so, of course, people find her inspiring. Now, of course, she has Nep Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So a lot of people born in the last whatever, you know, since we started working with Pluto are going to have Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto retrograde, which really is a strong indication that we are in a time and a place where deep and profound change needs to happen in how our world functions. And it's going to be led by the people who have these planets retrograde. It really, again, it really resonates with what, with what Jeffrey wrote. And you know, I have to be honest, I, until I read it again today, I didn't realize that obviously on some level it influenced me very deeply when I read his book. Okay, Paul Simon. Now, I've, I found it interesting that he has a Saturn retrograde conjunct Uranus retrograde, and he's also got Mars retrograde. So how, do, how, how does that manifest? Well, for me, it, you know, first of all, those two planets retrograde are in the ninth house. Granted, they're intercepted. However, throughout the course of his career, he has experimented with all different kinds of styles of music, genres of music, you know, traditions of music, and always with a deep need, more is in the eighth retrograde to really understand what it was. And he has Mars retrograde in Aries in the eighth house. So, you know, he's a powerhouse and yet he's often chosen to use that energy in, in, in ways that you wouldn't expect. So, you know, his, his first, uh, I want to say dance with success came through, uh, a, a, you know, a more folk style kind of music, but he did not stick with that. And, and he could have, you know, lots of times, you know, we all have favorite artists that we like and, and some of them seem to continue on a similar track, whereas he went in a different, completely different direction. Okay, and then I thought I might just share my chart with you, just so you could see all the retrogrades in my chart. And interestingly enough, I want to say I have Venus and Mars retrograde and they co-rule my, my 10th house. I said midheaven and that's wrong. I wrote that's wrong. So um, in fact, I've had people say to me, oh, well, Mars retrograde and ruling your midheaven, you must've had re real difficulties, you know, succeeding. And, and in many respects, that has not been the case. My challenges have always been with whether people in authority understood me at all. And, uh, and so I can, the, the conclusions that I have drawn and the things that I've shared with you today come not just from my study of astrology, but from my own life experience and looking at what the traditional, uh, and I'm not saying that all of what we say traditionally in terms of, uh, you know, like for instance, Saturn retrograde often feels like a father who is not present or doesn't weigh in on things and I can say that that's true but that's only one aspect of it and so we have to be very difficult careful uh, when we're looking at, uh, don't don't toss out the traditional uh, insights or awarenesses or definitions or keywords or any of those things don't throw them out with it that's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. it's just that it doesn't tell the whole story it doesn't say anything about what can and be done with those placements because if you look at and i think that often the more traditional meanings that go back to uh, uh classical astrology and hellenistic astrology were largely based on uh event charts on mundane astrology not necessarily how they function in the chart of a human being and the truth is, as I said in the beginning, you are not your chart and your chart is not you, which means you have a choice as to how you use what's there. Because we, you know, direct planets are not all, any easier at times to deal with than retrograde planets. It all depends on the whole 
I want to say the whole enchilada, the, 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 the synthesis of what it is you're working with. And of course, in, in this regard, astrology is extremely complex, which makes it all the more powerful. And why, you know, after 46 years of studying it, I'm still in love with it as much as I was in the beginning, because there's no end to, you know, how much a, you, you can learn, become aware of, and also be entertained by. Okay. So in conclusion, you're not doomed if you have a planet or planets retrograde. Retrograde planets are not robbed of some essential energy they need to express themselves. I'm not saying that retrograde planets don't present us with challenges, but their essential nature is not, as I said before, it's not any more challenging than any other elements found in a birth chart. They just call on us to experience life from a deep inner perspective. One that offers the chance to regroup, reinvent, rethink, rework, etc., and just be, as well as grow in awareness of ourselves. Because after all, we're the only we, each of us, we're the only person that we have, essentially. And retrograde planets really help you come to know yourself. Uh, in a more um, yeah it's going to sound like I'm judging uh, direct planets and I'm not it's just the knowledge is different and it takes you inwards to yourself it's always a challenge for us to remember that we aren't what we do that's just part of who we are but we live in a world that tends to, to want to measure and, and judge everything based only on external action, because that can be measured. How, how do you measure what goes on internally? It, that's a difficult thing. As I said before, sometimes you don't even know that a shift has occurred until you find yourself responding to uh, circumstances in, 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 a, in a, a different way than you ever have. And then you realize you've actually processed and healed and transformed what you set out to to heal, transform, and etc. Okay, so and last but not least, a chuckle. I always like to end my my presentations with something that makes people laugh, and so I give you a second or two to see which sign you are or, or read all of them if that's what you want to do. Uh, and, and, you know, just before I end, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. If there aren't, uh, please be aware that if you want to reach out to me on Facebook, if a question pops into your head later on and you'd like the answer to it, please feel free to contact me be more than happy to answer your questions or have a dialogue with you. Because really, is there anything more fun than talking about astrology? Leslie, I do have yes. a few questions for you. Okay. Would you be able to go back to your chart? <laughs> um, I, don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I've ever backed up before. <laughs> Something. <laughs> I don't mean it. I, any oh. ideas? In, oh, hang on. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. go. I forgot I had a touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I noticed that you have Uranus retrograde squaring your nodes. Yes. Have you given that a lot of thought and how does it manifest for you or what conclusions have you come to or where are you in that pro, um, process? Well, I have to admit, I have a number of friends who are EA astrologers, <laughs> and uh, um, well, it won't come as a surprise if I tell you I've suffered trauma in relationships and connection with other people, which is what you would expect. 
from that. Um, however, you know, and I would say that, you know, it, how do I encapsulate how that, how I've experienced that, uh, except to say, uh, not only did I experience trauma, but it was a huge uh, trigger for self-development. Uh, partly because, well, I have seven planets and air signs, so I always need to, and Saturn and Virgo, so I always need to know why things are the way they are. You know, when you look at my old chart, it you, you can see that I'm always asking questions. And in asking questions, I'm always seeking an ant, and not, you know, not just something to soothe me, but something to challenge me. So I think that that you know, as much as uh, uh, connections with others in this lifetime have been uh, difficult and challenging, they have been a source, a tremendous source of growth for me. D does that answer your question? Absolutely, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, just a quick question. Um, you said earlier, why does it need to be remade? And um, I'm applying that to your Uranus square, the nodes, that there's a challenge to transform your egocentric emotional structure. And so why does it need to be remade? Okay, now I'm confused because I don't, <laughs> I've confused myself. I, so can you? Not, they're not making sense, <laughs> sorry. Oh, the question isn't making sense? No. Um, I, I, I said, ref I don't know that I said remade. I said, I, I said reframe and recalibrate. Ah, okay, okay. Be because, you know, the essential energy of the planet doesn't change. Uh -huh. However, when it's retrograde, it offers you the opportunity not just to, to, to because, you know, the outer planets in particular are really have pack a big wallop. And if you're not um, taking time when they're retrograde, it gives you a bit a more of an opportunity to observe the results of the things that you do. So mm -hmm. you can re reframe your, your not, I, I wish I could say, I'm not going to claim that looking at my own chart, that that particular uh, Uranus square, my nodal axis doesn't continue to manifest because it does. Mm. It, it just is, I have learned, because you see my south nodes in Libra, I've learned to say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. To me, that would be reframing my reality. Because, you, you know, when you're looking at the nodal axis, it operates as a whole, not as, you know, I know we want to experience it as, as a polarity, but it also is an axis. And so uh, I guess when I said re reframe and recalibrate, <clears throat> I meant you know, taking the knowledge and the awareness that comes from going within to reframe how you relate to your outer world. Does that make more sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Thank I'm going to need to make that clearer in that slide. I thank you so much for that question. So do we have any uh, more questions from our audience here? I have a, just have a comment. Um, Hi, Leslie. I love, I, I, I love this. This is great. Um, I loved especially what you, your premise that the inner work comes first. And um, which totally, I mean, that, that really resonates with me having Mercury and Jupiter retrograde in quincunx with each other. And Mercury <laughs> is stationary at the bottom of my chart. And it feels like my whole life has been about you know trying to figure out how to interact with the world and how to um, and and just trying to make sense of it all before I can even comment and and you know it, it, the you know what you said also about the, the how how can you measure that inner shift that that yeah. inner work I I just love it thank you so much. Well, and thank you for your comment, Sue. Uh, as you can tell with South Node and Libra in the third house and Mars and Neptune, I, I like comments. <laughs> I like feedback. 
Well, we're we're just about the same age. I'm probably about six months older than you. So I oh okay. I I, 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 get, I get you know I my my le my nodes are in uh, switched into uh, Pisces and Virgo. So Mercury is a little more you know internal and you know important in the <laughs> chart. But yeah, I I I I see I get where you're coming from. Well, and, and, and what we're talking about is basic foundational principles of how to use retrogrades. Um, and so thank you for sharing your, your story. And of course, it, of course, you would feel that way if your cells knows in Virgo and you've got a retrograde Mercury ru ruling it. Right. It <laughs> conjunct it between. Oh, it conjunct it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So when is your birthday, Sue? Your Virgo? September 4th. Belated happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. So Leslie, I see your chart as being a, you know, a classic example of somebody teaching retrogrades with, <laughs> <laughs> who has many retrogrades. So you've got that Uranus there uh, on the seventh. Um, that's the way you relate to others. And this is the message that you have for them and to teach them. So thank you very much. You've got, um, Rx planet in the sixth, in the eleventh, and in the third. So great. and conjunct my ascendant. Yes. So it's all there. It's fantastic. You didn't see Pluto. Come on. I did. Well, the the Pluto <laughs> point is in the seventh. So how? You know, sometimes sometimes I look at that chart and wonder what was I thinking. <laughs> oh I love what you said about um, the current Mars retrograde and the impulsive action that can happen and that anyone with Mercury retrograde in the chart, it would be a bonus for them to have Mercury retrograde because it allows them to stop and think <laughs> before taking that action. Um, well, I think that some of the challenge we face in astrology is we forget sometimes to, you know, because synthesis, you know, it is an ongoing process, you know, yeah looking at all of the elements in a chart. And so, you know, I, as I said before, I started studying 46 years ago and on and off retrogrades have, you know, popped into my consciousness and I've thought a lot about, yeah, I, I just don't resonate with what's being said, but it's only been, you know, everything comes together when it's supposed to. And, you know, it's entirely possible. Like for instance, if, if you're looking at a horary chart or you're looking at an event chart, uh, a Saturn retrograde can indicate delays, but I don't know that it's fair to apply that same thing to a human being's life because that's that's presupposing that you know exactly what they're going to do with what they got. Because as we all know, when we're looking at our own charts or looking at other people's charts, there's there there's a lot of ways to express that energy, like each sign, each planet. Each house has a multitude of opportunities, options, choices. So, in fact, you know, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, someone once looked at my chart and he said to me, oh, you must have, he was looking at my Mars retrograde in the third house. Oh, you must have had a lot of trouble in school. I said, no. He said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, yeah, it was my life. <laughs> I really did because he wasn't looking at the trines to my planets and Aquarius. I, I did very well in school. Yes. So, yes. So again, you know, um, so of course you can tell by looking at my chart, what interests me is complexity. <laughs> so I, I'm, you know, I'm really, again, I want to say thank you so much. I, there is one more slide. Oh, look, it's fine. We can go over a little bit. Please don't worry about the time. In fact, um, we have one other question from our audience for you. Oh, okay. And you can go to your next slide if, if you wish. Excuse me? Please, you can go to your next slide if you wish. You said you had one oh. more slide. Oh, no. Well, no, if there's a question. Yeah. What's the question? Go well, ahead. So I have um, practically like a grand square going on. Um, in my chart, and mm -hmm. then Neptune retrograde is a part of it, and yep. so it's more exact to uh, Saturn and Pluto, oh, excuse me, Saturn square opposite Venus. 
and then it's mm -hmm. a little like out of orb with my moon in there as well mm -hmm. uh, so they're all in mutable signs oh yeah and so everything's direct except for this neptune opposite venus is retrograde in sagittarius and, and what and what house is it in it's in the fifth so my Venus is in the 11th. So you know what I would say about that Neptune retrograde? What would you say? You have a deep well of creativity that just pops in and out. Yeah. I would you can, in other it. words, you know, you're not always going to know where your inspiration comes from. Mm. It's just going to manifest. It, it also would give you the opportunity. I mean, really, you can very empathic the, the challenge would be not to internalize everything that you pick up from other people mm -hmm. especially since it's opposite your venus but a, but a retrograde neptune is is, is a person who has a really uh, interesting relationship with physical reality mm. i would say all of that is really true and yeah. yeah, like I remember now in my like mature adult self, I now understand that there are things that I perceive that aren't from within me, you know, and I probably didn't figure that out till I was about 30. I just thought it was all me. Well, but now I can sense that, that even though I pick up on it doesn't mean it's coming from within me. And I actually discovered that on accident. Um, because someone was like sitting next to me and I just said out loud, like, wow, I really just wanted to butter some toast. And <laughs> it was just a stranger, you know, out in public. And that person said, wow, I just went to the farmer's market and bought my favorite bread. And I was thinking about going home and like buttering my toast. <laughs> See? That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I hadn't said it in that moment, like I would have not connected with that person over that. So the fact that I voiced it, you know, was what brought the connection. Well, I, I think, you know, in a strange sort of way, you know, we, we have experiences which are designed to signal to us exactly what is operating within us. And so you add that experience so you understand how easily you can get into other people's spaces and places and even know what they're thinking. Yeah. Because, you know, I have, I have Neptune in the third and I have the moon trying that retrograde Neptune and I do sessions for people and they will say to me, are, are you living in my head? I just thought that very thing this morning mm. or whenever. So, uh, but you know, for me, that's a powerful creative soul, like drawing on, and, and when I say creativity, I'm not just talking about uh, because creativity can manifest in all kinds of different ways. I'm not just talking about what we consider to be the creative arts. I'm talking about life in general and the capacity to create. And, you know, you just have a natural inclination to do that. And the Neptune retrograde would uh, resist the, the, the push from others to, to uh, from any kind of force outside yourself to, to, to create a life that is not meaningful to you. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it really does. It's really affirming. Cause, yeah. Yeah, I just feel like more and more each day, really. So thank you. Awesome. Well, you're most welcome. <laughs> if it, you know, uh, I, one of my biggest fears used to be because I've Saturn and Virgo, right? And I have performance anxiety uh, was oh my God, what happens if somebody tells me a bunch of stuff about their chart and I have, don't know what to say? <laughs> anyway. So uh, I guess we can move on to the last slides. Nope, oh, we did that one, we did that one. Okay, and so this is my uh, thank you page. And, uh, and as you can see, it's a sh shameless plug for my new podcast which is, uh, I've been playing with a lot with it this summer, and, and now it's going to be probably twice a month. One, uh, I will always be doing a podcast when the sun moves from one sign to another, 
Uh, I try doing the monthly thing, but it always feels out of sync for me from an astrological point of view. If you're going to be talking about astrology, you should be talking about the forecast when the sun is in a particular sign. So, uh, and the other one, uh, the other podcast monthly will be whatever I feel like talking about. <laughs> so there's the link to that. Uh, there's my website and there's the email address you can reach me at. Uh, again, it really, this was such a pleasure and not the least of which is because I, I kind of got to reconnect to some of how, you know, reconnect to the, the awareness of how much EA astrology actually affected and has affected my practice of astrology, even though I would not call myself an EA astrologer. So Leslie, finally, um, we just wanted to make a comment about your earrings. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, well, okay. I, as everybody can see, they're, they're Saturn earrings. Uh, I need to get a pair of Uranus earrings, but <laughs> um, I, I got a, a friend of mine bought them for me in, in London, England last year at a store called Caddy Divine. And, and, and I actually have some others that are just stars. Uh, they have a website and that's Caddy, T-A-T-T-Y, Divine, D-E-V-I-N-E at dot com, dot com. So, you know, you never know, they might still have them. Oh, they're great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Um, It's been wonderful. We love having you as a new speaker. And we'd now all like to thank you very much and we hope to see you next time. Would you all please thank Leslie Francis, everyone? Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Well, and thanks again. And I, of course, would, uh, I'm always open to being invited back. <laughs> Definitely. We would love that. Okay, thank you and bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>